So we've talked about the glucose and the glucose metabolites, but there are other sources for fuel that can provide us the energy to regenerate ATP. So what other fuel sources can we use? And more importantly, why do we need to use other fuel sources? We need to use other fuel sources because we are not constantly having a stable source of glucose. In order to meet energetic demands by have, with fluctuation in our glucose levels, we know we're gonna be able to use pyruvate and we're gonna be able to use lactate like we talked about before. But we'll also be able to use lipids via beta oxidation. We'll also be able to use ketone bodies. We'll also be able to use proteins via uh, glucogenic or amino uh, glucogenic or ketogenic amino acids, where they can either provide the acetyl CoA that is necessary, provide the ketone bodies that is necessary, or provide the intermediates within the Krebs cycle that's necessary. Each one of these fuel sources gives us a secondary pathway that we're able to meet our ATP demands by having available fuel sources outside of the carbohydrates of glucose or fructose. So let's go ahead and start by taking a look at lipids. And in order to look at lipids, we have to start with the breakdown of lipids or li lipolysis. Lipolysis is where we catabolize a triglyceride droplet, a triacylglyceride or a lipid droplet from muscle or from adipose tissue or from liver. And we mobilize the fatty acid that we can then go about using it in beta oxidation so that we can go about generating acetyl-CoA that can enter into the Krebs cycle. In this, we have to remember that it's easier to mobilize the saturated fats versus the unsaturated fats within the molecule. It's also easier to do beta oxidation on the saturated fat than it is to do it on the unsaturated fat which means that we're going to be taking unsaturated fats that happen to be there and converting them into saturated fats for the purpose of energetics. This is going to be regulated hormonally by small molecular weight growth hormone, insulin-like growth factor, cortisol, epinephrine, testosterone, triidothyronine or T3 hormones, leptin, adiponectin, and insulin. Some of these will stimulate the pathways to allow for lipolysis. Some of these will be inhibiting the pathway for lipolysis. So insulin is going to be inhibiting the pathway, even though it's on here as a regulatory. Remember, we can regulate to accentuate or we can regulate to inhibit. So let's take a look at the pathway as it lays out. So we have hormones such as growth hormone, thyroid hormones, glucagon, epinephrine, they're all going to be activating enzyme pathways starting with an adenylene cyclase. This adenylene cyclase is going to produce a cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP is going to activate an enzyme known as a PKA. This PKA is going to take hormone-sensitive lipase, HSL, and convert it from its inactive form to its active form. If we do not stimulate hormone-sensitive lipase, we do not get a large amount of lipolysis. Hormone-sensitive lipase is going to split off fatty acids from the triacylglyceride, one fatty acid at a time. This pathway will continue until hormone-sensitive lipase gets turned off by phosphatase. Now that phosphatase enzyme is the same phosphatase that we saw before in terms of the enzyme that is stripping away the phosphate from the uh, glucose mobilization pathway or from the gluconeogenesis pathway. Now, insulin is going to come in and it's going to inhibit this pathway. It's going to inhibit this pathway two ways. First way is it's going to stimulate phosphatase, thereby inhibiting hormone-sensitive lipase. The other thing it does is it stimulates an enzyme known as phosphodiesterase. And what phosphodiesterase does is it blocks the PKA and it locks cyclic AMP into what's, what's referred to as its five prime form, thereby stopping PKA from functioning, which means that we're not activating any inactive hormone-sensitive lipase, and any activated hormone-sensitive lipase becomes inactive. There are other hormones that come into play that can inhibit such as prostaglandin E, 
adenosine and nicotinic acid, which all block the adenylin cyclase activation that epinephrine, growth hormone, thyroid hormones, or glucagon are all stimulating. There is an ergogenic aid that most of us consume at large quantities throughout the day that also has a secondary effect on here, and that is caffeine. Caffeine does two things. Number one, it's going to act ag agonistically with epinephrine, so it's going to stimulate additional beta adrenergic responses, but it's also going to block phosphodiesterase function and block adenosine function, thereby allowing for an accentuation of hormone sensitive lipase and lipolysis. So, if we want to have lipolysis, we want to stimulate hormone sensitive lipase. This stimulation is controlled by PKA and phosphatase in which PKA will allow for activation and phosphatase will allow for inhibition of the enzyme. So once we have freed that fatty acid from the lipid, we now have to get it across the mitochondrial membrane. And this is where we're going to be utilizing an acetylation reaction in which we're going to transport via a carnitine molecule from the inner excuse me, from the outer membrane to the inner membrane, and then allow for that acetylated fatty acid to go about and enter into what's referred to as the beta oxidation pathway. Now notice we have some CoA's in here. You remember I talked about with the Krebs cycle how the mitochondria needs CoA's? The CoA is there to allow for transportation across membranes within the mitochondria. And that's one reason why, and we'll look at a pathway that comes into play here in a second, that's going to allow us to regenerate some of those CoAs for continual mitochondrial functioning. So let's go ahead and take a look at beta oxidation, which is going to occur within the inner regions of the mitochondria. So beta oxidation is the process of mobilizing fatty acids, taking mobilized fatty acids, and turning them into acetyl-CoA. And what is up happening is that for every two carbons within the fatty acid chain, we will get one acetyl-CoA. We break down beta oxidation based off of the length of fatty acid chain that we're dealing with, in which we will have something known as a short chain, a medium chain, or a long chain fatty acid. This is anywhere from four to 16 carbons in terms of the length of fatty acids. Anything more than 16 the very long chain fatty acids, we will use peroxisomes via a PPAR system. What we need to stipulate here is that we get a bigger bang for our buck from the lipids via beta oxidation than we get from the other means to regenerate ATP. So for one acetyl-CoA for every two carbons from the fatty acid chain, means that we're going to get somewhere between four and eight acetyl-CoA's being formed for most of the fatty acid chains that come about. We get additional FADH2's and NADHH pluses within the process of forming the acetyl-CoA's, which means we get additional FADH2's and NADHH pluses to be used in the electron transport chain. So let's take a look at the pathway here, and we start with the breakdown of the triglycerides into their fatty acid chains. And then those fatty acid chains being acetylated and transported into the mitochondria, forming the fatty acetyl-CoA. This fatty acetyl-CoA will undergo a dehydrogenasing reaction, forming FADH2s. We then undergo a secondary reaction of a hydration, sticking a water onto it. We then undergo a dehydrating reaction, removing hydrogens, forming the NADHH+, forming what's referred to as beta-ketoacyl-CoA. This beta-ketoacyl-CoA will get split via an enzyme into an acetyl-CoA, and then a fatty acetyl-CoA. That fatty acetyl-CoA is the initial fatty acetyl-CoA minus two carbons. So if we start with 10, the next loop that comes back is going to start with eight.
And the next loop is going to come back and it's going to start with six. And then the final loop is going to start with four. If we start with four in the fatty acetyl CoA, we form two acetyl CoAs at the end. This acetyl CoA that gets formed can either go to the Krebs cycle or will go to ketogenesis, the formation of ketone bodies. The cycle is going to continue until we get a hormonal signal that says stop. And the stop signal is breaking down of the lipids, sending them into the mitochondria. Or we don't have enough transporters to get the fatty acids into the mitochondria. Or we've broken down the chain to the point where the only thing that we can form are acetyl CoAs. The beta oxidation even though it's providing a large return, is going to be very low in terms of the rate of return. So we get a larger amount of ATP coming back, but the rate at which ATP gets formed relative to the other pathways is relatively slow. And because it's relatively slow, we can start having excessive beta oxidation. The excessive beta oxidation will lead to an accumulation of acetyl-CoA, the accumulation of acetyl-CoA is going to initiate the production of ketones via ketogenesis. What this is going to do is this is going to recycle CoAs back to the mitochondria so that the mitochondria can continue to do what the mitochondria needs to do and have CoAs available within the CoA pool. Now, a lot of people will reference ketones as being bad. The reason why it gets referenced as being bad is that if someone is hyperglycemic and producing ketones within the plasma, we start to shift towards having more hydrogen donors within the plasma and start to experience acidosis. Ketones itself is a very efficient fuel source, particularly if we're attempting to minimize ROS development and can be a preferential fuel source for cardiac muscle and for neurons or any other cell or tissue that is aerobic obligated. So let's take a look at how we go about forming ketones and how ketones can go back and be used as a fuel source. So we start with high amounts of beta oxidation leading to excessive amounts of acetyl-CoA. That acetyl-CoA can go about linking together, relieving a CoA that can go back to the CoA pool. We then link the acetyl-acetyl-CoA with another acetyl-CoA, sending CoAs back to the CoA pool. We would then form hydroxymethylglutarol-CoA. That hydroxymethylglutarol-CoA will split into what's referred to as acetoacetate and form an acetyl-CoA. That acetyl-CoA will then cycle back to form onto the acetyl acetyl CoA to form more hydroxymethylglutarate CoA, allowing for more acetoacetate to form. Acetoacetate in circulation will automatically degrade into two molecules of acetone. Enzymatically, acetoacetate can undergo a dynamic equilibrium forming hydroxybutyrate. In forming hydroxybutyrate, we have to take some of the NADH H pluses that have been formed in the, in the beta oxidation in order to allow for the beta hydroxybutyrate. When we talk about ketone bodies, these are what we are talking about. These are the ketone bodies. The rate limiting step in ketogenesis is excessive amounts of beta oxidation leading to too much acetyl CoA. So that's forming ketone bodies, but we can also utilize ketone bodies. And the ketone bodies that we utilize are beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. Beta-hydroxybutyrate will get reconverted back to acetoacetate. Acetoacetate will react with succinyl-CoA, forming acetyl-CoA, forming succinate, which will can go back to the Krebs cycle to reform succinyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA will then go to the Krebs cycle, 
in order to allow for the production of NADHH pluses, FADH2s, and ATP. And so that's, not, that's one of the other fuel sources that we're looking at. The last of the fuel sources that we look at is the amino acids and proteins. Now, amino acid and protein comes about via a hormonally regulated process, which is regulated by cortisol and to a lesser extent, glucagon. This is where we are going to deaminate and transaminate amino acids. We have to first free up the amino acids from the proteins via proteolysis. We typically see a large amount of proteolysis during periods of prolonged glucose starvation. That is where we are not meeting the glucose demands with what we readily have available for the body. This produces a large amount of CO2 and a large amount of water within the pathways. So let's take a look at the deamination and then the transamination pathway. So the deamination pathway, what is up happening is that via enzymatic regulation, an amine is stripped forming ammonia. The ammonia will then go into the ureic cycle forming urea. All of this is taking place within the hepatocytes. The other means that we could go about getting proteins available is to refer to as the transamination. In the transamination, I am shifting an amine group from one ketone to another ketone. In terms of where we can get the proteins into the ATP production, it's about where within the Krebs cycle we will get them into. Now, some of the deaminated amino acids will form precursors to pyruvate, which can be used in the gluconeogenesis, gluconeogenesis pathway. Other intermediates will be used within the Krebs cycle, in which the ketogenic forms alanine, cysteine, glycine, serine, threonine, isoleucine, leucine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, lysine, can all form molecules which will form either pyruvate or acetyl-CoA. The glucogenic forms of the amino acids will form OAA, fumaric or fumarate, succinyl-CoA, or alpha-ketoglutarate. These include asparic acid, asparagine, phenylalanine, tyrosine, isoleucine, methionine, valine, arginine, histamine, glutamine, and proline. Now, other molecules can go about and enter into the gluconeogenic pathway by forming pyruvate. This includes alanine and glutamine via glutamic acid being metabolized into pyruvate. It is this pathway where glutamic acid gets produced into pyruvate that the misconception of where the metabolites within gluconeogenesis comes from. Remember, gluconeogenesis is the production of glucose from glucose metabolites by hepatocytes and to a lesser extent, the juxtaglomerular and juxtanephronic cells within the kidneys.